Und. Okay, so welcome everyone to today's uh, BMP webinar. I have the great uh, pleasure of introducing Professor Stephen Walker as our speaker. Stephen is a professor in the Department of Mathematics and the Department of Statistics and Data Science at the University of Texas at Austin. A very prolific author and esteemed member of our community, Stephen research focuses on Bayesian methods, including non-parametric, asymptotic, computational, and methodological and foundational. The topic of his talk today is random measures for martingales, applications to Bayesian non-parametrics. As always, you can ask clarification questions during the presentation, and we ask you to hold all non-clarification questions until the end of the presentation. Uh, Stephen, thank you for accepting this invitation. And without further ado, please join me in welcoming Stephen. Okay, thanks, Felipe. Um, and thanks to everybody for being here. Um, so uh, the title, Martingale Posterior Distributions, I, I uh, gave this talk before we actually put the paper up on archive. And it, it also um, could be about Bayesian uncertainty. So, so really part of the motivation um, is about trying to understand Bayesian uncertainty. And it's not necessarily something that just works in Bayesian non-parametrics, al although I think it's most um, applicable in Bayesian non-parametric problems, as they tend to be the harder uh, frameworks in which you try and do uh, the usual Bayes um, ideas. So joint work with Edwin Fong, who's a PhD student at the Turing Institute and joint Oxford, and um, also with Chris Holmes. Uh, and as I mentioned, the paper's on archive, and that's the reference to it. Uh, feel free, if, for, for clarification and any other concerns during the talk, just please interrupt, shout out, or whatever it is to get my attention, and I'll be happy to, to answer. Um, oh no, the scrolling has stopped. Uh, uh, it's back again. Okay. Uh, so um, the starting point, um, I'll, I'll make it this because it's it's uh, based on parametrics. So let, let's start at um, a posterior distribution on uh, distributions. Um, so for most of the maths and theory, I, I'm, I'm not really going to go into much of the details on that. There'll be one slide at the very end, which just picks up some necessary details. I'm really just going through some ideas um, uh, of what it is we're doing. Um, so that, as everyone's aware, would lead to a predictive, um, which is just the posterior mean. Um, so what we do now, um, so I'm, I'm not giving some background either as such. I mean, the best way to do that is actually just to go through what we do and give the explanations along the way. So I'm really trying to keep it as simple as possible. So at each point, um, everybody should be able to understand exactly what's going on. It may be the why we're doing things that doesn't become immediately clear. But hopefully as we move along, the why becomes more obvious gradually as I, as I go through the talk. So what we can do is take uh, an observation, another observation. So this is just going to be a randomly generated observation. So the, the idea is that the X1 to N have been observed. Uh, what comes next in terms of the Xn plus one and so on are gonna be generated from these predictors. So Xn plus one is randomly drawn from Pn. Um, update the posterior now include that extra data point, get the next predictive, and then take Xn plus two. Okay, so then it's obvious how that sequence would just carry on ad infinitum. I keep revising or updating the posterior, getting the predictive and sampling. Um, and that, uh, we obviously get out of that, uh, a sequence of random distribution functions, uh, PM uh, for M greater than or equal to N. 
may be hard to do because I, I guess in most non-parametric problems, this is actually not that feasible or very difficult to do simply because the posterior is difficult to get and then the predictor is difficult to get uh, and then sampling it probably is quite difficult as well. But that's, that's not relevant at the moment. Um, so one of the important point here is that the sequ that sequence is going to form a martingale. And just to explain or so that becomes really quite clear why it's a martingale, I can write the predictive in this particular way. So I can extract the xn plus one data point, if you like. Um, and what's on the denominator is actually what you're using to sample the xn plus one. Right? So if I take the expectation of um, the n plus one version of the distribution, predictive distribution, uh, it, the xn plus one disappears because it cancels out. Uh, and then in the numerator, it disappears because I just integrate over the f, uh, which obviously is one. So I just recover uh, the n predictive. Okay, so that's fairly straightforward. Um, so the last two equations are fairly straightforward, uh, given the idea that this is a, a martingale. Um, so for those of you who work in CID sequences, and I know there's all, I've seen a few, uh, Fabrizio, for example, and Sonia work on CID sequences, you'll already recognize the bottom equation. Um, but at the moment, um, this is um, uh, based on exchangeable sequences. So the other issue here is that obviously the Xn that I'm generating are going to be exchangeable. So, so this is the slide that I'm just running through. I mean, uh, you, you should say, okay, well, there should be some math supporting all of this. There is one slide at the end, which I'll put up, but really I'm just running through all of these points. As I said, there's a, quite a few things to get through and I just want to um, uh, avoid getting too deeply into the maths at this point. So the key, the key here is that the P infinity exists, uh, a random distribution function. Um, and then you might say, well, why, why would I ever do that? Well, yeah, it's, it's a good question. Uh, the point was, or the point is, is that Doob um, showed, and it's not strictly the Doob form uh, because I'm starting at a posterior rather than a prior, uh, but effectively, as we sample through these predictors, uh, we're getting effectively what is a Doob martingale. The martingale ideas he used to prove uh, some results about Bayesian uh, uh, methods. Um, so the idea here is that the P infinity can also be obtained uh, simply by sampling the posterior. So I get this P infinity at the end of this sequence. Um, and equally, I could have obtained such a P infinity just by sampling the posterior. So at, at this point, it's probably um, worth mentioning that you've got two ways of doing the same thing. So it's probably good to get sort of part of the idea of what we're doing and why out there. I could sample P infinity from the posterior and not worry about these future sequences at all. But Doob says I have an alternative. Doob says, well, if I can get the predictive, uh, I can do this infinite sampling uh, scheme and get a, an equivalent P infinity that way. Uh, so at, at, at this point, everyone would say, well, just sample the posterior, that's Bayes, just do the posterior. But I guess the ultimate message coming out of the talk is, well, why don't we treat Bayes as actually not sampling from the posterior, but rather as sampling this infinite sequence and getting P infinity out of it. And if I want to make certain assumptions about that infinite sequence in particular, that it's exchangeable, or the starting predictive comes from a proper Bayesian predictive, as it were, 
then I have this shortcut of getting P infinity, which is just sampling for, from the posterior. Okay. So I, I hope that that sort of uh, is sort of clear. So it's to try and say, no, the Bayesian idea, and I'll explain, try and explain why that's the Bayesian idea, is this sampling to infinity to get P infinity. And if I make certain assumptions about how I got it, I've got a shortcut, which is just sampling a posterior. And I'll delve more into that about the Bayesian uncertainty a bit later on. Um, so at this point, that sequence is exchangeable, but it's more, that is more than is actually required um, for the existence of P infinity. So actually do, and the result is actually just a demonstration of martingales. Um, so I could also get a, a martingale by sort of weakening the assumption of exchangeability and just going to generating a sequence which is uh, CID. This is conditionally identically distributed. And the pioneers of this kind of uh, these kind of sequences were Berta, uh, Bertie, Rigo, and co-authors and students. Um, and there's quite a lot. There's quite a lot of, of articles on that, um, on that those type of sequences. So where the talk's going is to say, okay, well, actually, it's easier to construct P infinity based on CID rather than exchangeable. And I think we all know that. You all know that actually, if I was going to take mixtures of Richelieu processes, for example, and try and get this P infinity limit, uh, it's not going to be easy because you need to get out the MCMC tools and it's going to be quite uh, cumbersome. Okay, so, so the idea is um, to use CID sequences at this point rather than exchangeable sequences simply but at this point because they're easier to get at. Uh, and you might say, well, we're violating Bayes, but as I said, when I come back to talk more about Bayesian uncertainty, we'll see actually we're not um, violating Bayes. We're actually sticking to probably what is an, an original or should be an original interpretation of what Bayes is actually doing. So just, just to uh, clarify exactly what uh, ideas are going along here. So this would be a proper Bayesian exchangeable setup where I start with a posterior um, and I get the correct uh, uh, predictive. So I'm trying to estimate a normal mean here. Um, so the model, if you like, the model that's missing from the predictive is just a normal uh, distribution with unknown mean theta and known variance sigma squared. Okay, so missing from that slide is what the actual model is. So the posterior with the model gives the predictive. I sample, I'm interested now in the theta. It's the theta that is of interest here because it's a parametric setting. Obviously in the non-parametric setting, it would be a distribution in the parametric setting, it's just the parameter. So I can construct the sequences. So basically I sample from the predictive, I update the posterior, I get the new predictive, I sample and just keep going. And if you look at the sample means that come out of this, uh, that's the X bar M, which I've written as theta M, it's a martingale, it converges. And the mass is not very difficult. You just see that the theta infinity, the limit, has exactly the same distribution as the posterior. Okay. So again, the, the important thing here is that there are two ways in which you can implement your base. You can either just sample from the posterior if you've got it, or uh, via a predictive, uh, keep, keep doing this infinite sampling and pick off the limit uh, parameter. Uh, on a more non-parametric uh, illustration, so everybody here will be well familiar with the um, effectively what is the Bayesian bootstrap posterior Dirichlet process based upon a improper prior. Uh, so here, Fn is the empirical distribution. 
So we all know that we can take such an F by weighting each of the data points with a all one Dirichlet distribution. That would be the direct posterior sampling route. And uh, everybody also knows that we could do a polyurethane sampling scheme and uh, take the empirical of the sample we get um, and the limiting uh, distribution is, is known to be exactly um, what we got from this uh, direct posterior sampling. Okay, so if we do a polyurethane scheme with those data and the weights one over n, um, we just recover uh, a random Dirichlet process from that posterior. So that would be another illustration of this two ways in which you can go to get the same thing. Um, so if we look at that, given that we're interested in Bayes nonparametrics, I can rewrite um, and we're interested in a, a sort of sequential idea. I can rewrite that, what I've just done, uh, the polyurn in this particular way. Um, so basically it's a case of uh, taking a sample from the PM and, and, and you just uh, put it back. Um, so it becomes a, a point mass. Um, that is obviously a martingale. It's not difficult to see that that gives you a martingale. And it's a very simple structure. Uh, it leads to the exchangeable sequence. So it's very simple. Um, the, the point about the uh, trying to implement this alternative uh, sampling strategy um, in the non-parametrics is hard simply because if I want to generalize that to have more smooth distributions, so obviously these are, these are discrete. Um, if I want these to be smoother, uh, and to maintain exchangeability, it's not straightforward. It's very difficult to do. However, uh, what is not difficult to do is to actually generalize that sequence or a sequence similar to it and actually maintain a martingale and hence convergence. So if we say to ourselves, okay, well, I just want some kind of uh, sequential uh, sequence that converges at this point, and not too worried about maintaining the exchangeability, but I just need to keep a martingale because I need this thing to converge. Then generalizing uh, that form at the top of this slide is actually fairly straightforward to do. Okay, so probably now we know what we're trying to do. The best uh, thing at this point is to explain what's the point. So the point is, is that if you've got these two uh, ways of um, implementing Bayes, let's think about Bayesian uncertainty or any uncertainty. Any uncertainty is being caused by what's missing. It, it's, it, so if we're talking about IID data, um, my uncertainty about what is the correct or what is the true distribution or parameter or whatever is being caused because I haven't got all the data. I've only got a part of it, just a sample of size n. So the claim is that the Bayesian uh, tackles that problem by simply constructing a distribution for what's missing given what has been seen. Right. So the idea is that that automatically generates a, distri a, a distribution which depends on what you have seen uh, on any statistic or parameter of interest. Right. So that's the idea of how Bayesians deal with uncertainty. So you can put it at that basic level without invoking priors exchangeability or anything at this point and just say no, that they deal with uncertainty by just trying to put a distribution on what is missing, which if known, there would be no uncertainty left. Everything you would want to know is known from uh, seeing uh, the full data set. So it's a sort of direct target of trying to deal with uncertainty. 
uh, by putting a distribution on what's missing, given what you've seen. So for example, if I'm interested in uh, the mean of the infinite sample, uh, my statistic would be the sample mean. Uh, and the distribution on the x1 to infinity here would obviously also in, induce a distribution on tm, right? on the limit of tm, the t infinity, uh, subject to suitable, uh, uh, some uh, obvious suitable conditions on, on means, existence and things. Um, so our point, uh, which you could have said, well, why didn't you say this at the beginning? And as I said, before the paper appeared, I did give talks along this sort of lines. Is that really where all this is coming from is the idea that all I really want to do as a Bayesian is construct a distribution of what's missing given what I've seen. That's it. That's all I want to do. Uh, but obviously, um, if I want a P infinity to materialize at the end of this, because that's what I, I need, um, that would be my object, given that I've now got a complete data set. We need P infinity to exist, given that um, I'm putting a distribution on the N plus one to infinity. Um, so there are some technical things going on here in the background, but uh, as I said, there's probably a slide or two I can put up at the end, which will uh, put the maths into some uh, more concrete uh, footing. So again, I just say again, that's the point. All we're doing as Bayesians is putting a distribution on what's missing. And if you say, no, they're constructing a prior and a posterior, well, all the stuff I've just gone through with Doob explains that they're the same. The point is, is that if I'm willing to put this distribution on what's missing, given what I've observed in a very specific way, then actually I have this shortcut through the posterior. So in a way, that's um, how, how it would be good to see things. Um, that if you're willing to make certain assumptions about how you're constructing that distribution of what's missing, given what you've seen, um, you have a shortcut. You don't actually need to implement this infinite sample scheme. You just take things directly from the posterior. So if we're thinking about this um, predictive, really a predictive is just a distribution estimator, right? I mean, there's nothing that says a predictive is the best estimation of a distribution given a particular sample, right? Um, there's, that's certainly not the case. So the idea that we must use a predictive to sample into the future is clearly not true. I just basically need something that is a good estimator of a distribution given what I've seen. And it's not hard to get. And then I hope you start to see the argument coming into place because you say, well, actually I can get a very easy density estimator or distribution estimator, which I can sample from and then just put the observation back into it to get the predictive or dense distribution estimator with another, uh, an extra sample. And you might say, well, that's a lot easier to do than going through this non-parametrics of the prior and the posterior and the usual necessary MCMC strategies um, that can often be quite difficult to implement. So to implement this idea now of the infinite sampling, we really just need a distribution estimator Parallel sampling, because I'm going to repeat this many times to get many P infinities to represent all the possible samples uh, I can get to adequately look at the uncertainty involved. Um, but bearing in mind I need P infinity to exist, um, we need to be a little bit careful. The obvious way to construct the distribution on the infinite sequences to make it sequential, that's obvious. So really all I need at each sample size n is a estimator of a distribution, not a problem, but the constraint um, is that it's a martingale. So um, Bayes sequences are martingales, it would be good 
to keep a martingale sequence there so that we have a guaranteed convergence. And actually the martingale also is the thing that connects it up to the CID um, sequence. So this constraint at the bottom is, is, is going to be uh, required. So we need to find a good distribution estimator, something that we're happy to say, yeah, this is a good estimator of the distribution combined with the constraint um, at the bottom. So that, that now becomes, if you like, the, the task um, at hand. Are, are there any questions at this point? I hope I hope that the, there's probably an uh, umpteen thousand ways to tell this sort of story, and it's a question of in which order you do it. So I hope the order in which I've done it this time is sort of um, uh, makes sense. Okay, I'll I'll move on. Mm. So really the, the rest of this is about how to do it. Um, so further motivation for how we end up doing it comes from a paper I did with um, uh, a few years ago now um, with Ryan Martin and Richard Hahn. And to motivate it, if we go to the, um, go back to the Bayesian predictive, uh, and the, the basic idea of what this slide is trying to do is to say, look, I can write the predictive in a sequential way using the copular density, right? I mean, that's all that's going on here. It's just juggling things around and saying, okay, well, I can write it in the, the second line is how we wrote it before. I'm now introducing the PMX. And then if you look at what's inside that integral, um, that's a copula. It's a copula because the marginals are what's on the denominator. Okay, so um, it's it's a copula. So I can write it as um, this very nice update of a predictive. Um, it looks deceptively simple, and then you say, "Well, what, what, what's the problem? Why is this so impossible?" To implement given that you're just going to have this very nice sequential update. The problem is, is that for most Bayes non-parametric sequences, those copulas become horrendous. Uh, the point, the reason why they become horrendous is because you're trying to maintain this exchangeability and it just makes them horrendously complicated. You can try and simplify it, like people like Newton try to simplify it by removing some of the complexity. But if you're going to be a real Bayesian sequence, it's just horrendously complicated sequence of copulas. So I guess part of the argument is that, look, I can make that copula fairly simple without throwing away any of the accuracy. I don't really need to force it to make, give me an exchangeable sequence. I can actually simplify it quite a lot and make this sequence actually work in practice so I can actually do all the sampling. And yet accuracy, accuracy is not going to diminish. Um, the question is whether you really think that exchangeability is part of accuracy and debatable, but probably not. Um, so uh, if I'm, as we're interested in distributions, I can get the distribution out of that. So the, it, it basically says that the, um, just the, sequence of distributions is basically just a partial derivative of a copula. Um, and so the idea is, okay, let me choose a copula, a good copula, so I, I can keep accuracy, but I'm not really happy for it still to be forced by this prior posterior setup. Um, so the question is, okay, well, what copula? How should this copula look? Well, if I go back to the Bayesian bootstrap, because we know that that works, we know that, that it's not smooth, it's not very nice, it's not very elegant, but it, at least we know it works. If we go to this and say, well, look, all I'd really want to do is knock out that one, that indicator for something a bit more smoother. Um, you can understand that um, this, uh, 
sequence, this real Bayesian bootstrap sequence through this copula, the maximal copula. So really you can think of it, well, I, what I've really got here is the independence copula on one side and I've got the maximal copula on the other. Uh, you might say, well, it's not differentiable everywhere. Okay, in, in some sort of um, way, uh, you can recover this derivative you know, v less v less than u u less than v kind of thing. Um, so really, what's what's going on here is that the the real base that's discrete and we know works is basically a combination weighted the alpha n of an independence copula and the maximal copula, which is quite appealing in some way. Um, it, it's, it's a combination of those two copulas, copulas and the alpha m is going to zero. So you end up more and more getting pushed towards the independence copula. And, and that's really where the convergence is coming from. Um, so in, in this context, it's really the alpha m going to behaving in a particular way that um, gets us the convergence. So the idea is, is simply to replace that one indicator with a more smooth version of it and you know not necessarily having to think too hard about it, it would say okay let me put a Gaussian copula um, with a correlation parameter rho so literally just to smooth that out a bit and, and you know it, it has a feel about a sort of kernel type idea so a Gaussian copula um, would, would be appropriate, although we've played around with other copulas as well. I mean, so I'm not being light on this. It's just, it, it's just uh, at, at a first go, it would be the most suitable to use. Um, so if that's the copula, then we have a sequence of predictors because we're literally just plugging in those P's into the copula. And if I'm using a Gaussian copula, uh, the sequence is this. It's the replacement of the indicator with the Gaussian copula that now knocks out the exchangeability. So the exchangeability is gone. Right? But the claim is that accuracy has not gone. And we've maintained a martingale. Not only have we maintained a martingale, but sampling from this sequence uh, is actually straightforward. Um, it's not difficult to sample from PM and then update and then just keep going until you get the P infinity. So the sampling scheme of taking the X's from the P's, recycling, getting P infinity is going to give us a limit. It's going to give us a P infinity because of the martingale. And the martingale is arising out of this property here. So the, if, I, if, if I take the partial derivative of the copula and then integrate over that variable, I get back to the other argument. So I get back to the U argument. Um, so for us, that would be the PM. So if I take the expectation of PM plus one with respect to the XM plus one, which is coming from PM, I'm just going to recover the PM. Okay, so that's writing it more succinctly with H uh, taking the place of that um, uh, specific form of the um, Gaussian copula. Um, but any copula obviously would work, and the H here would be the partial derivative, uh, the, again, the corresponding partial derivative. So as I said at the bottom, Gaussian copula with correlation rho, but it doesn't need to be the Gaussian copula. I mean, there are other possibilities here. But bear in mind that really all you want to do is smooth the indicator function. Um, so the Gaussian copula would, would work uh, as well as anything else. And as I said again, you've knocked away the exchangeability, but you've maintained the martingale and a CID sequence. Um, any any questions up to here before I just go through a couple of examples? Uh, 
Okay, so this this is a, a, a I guess a sort of this is a non uh, this is a um, a parametric example. Um, so, can I ask a question here? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, so, can you explain? Uh, whether I'm, this kind of you might uh, need to shout a bit louder i can't hear very well hello this is better um so can you explain if if this kind of alternative way of seeing uh, the Bayes theorem helps to deal with uh, model misspecification like in the parametric setup if i were to um if i were to do this uh, repeated sampling and obtain the p infinity would that be different from uh, the posterior if uh, this the data is not generated from the model so i, I think i picked up enough of that to, to answer so so the idea here is that the x's are uh this, the, these would be nothing other than iid sequence um so the the assumption is is that there's an IID sequence and the limit P infinity here is a random draw from uh, a, what we call now martingale posterior distribution, which represents the uncertainty based on a finite sample of size little n um, of the distribution generating uh, the sample. Right? So the reason why we claim, um, you say, no, but you must be really Bayes. You've got to do this as a Bayesian. So the, the slide that made this point is, is this one here. Our interpretation of Bayes through the Dube result is that we prefer to think of the implementation of Bayes as an infinite sampling scheme and picking off the random parameter at the end, which we can do and is unique because it's uniquely defined once we've got a complete data set. Right? And our contention at this point is, okay, well, you, you, you want to do real Bayes because it gives you the shortcut through the posterior. That, that's, that, that's nice in a way, but hard to do, uh, difficult to do. And, and also our claim is that, well, uh, why do I need the predictive? Why do I need this distribution for what's missing given what I've seen to be really based on this Bayesian predictive, which goes back to making assumption about what I have seen, right? Um, in terms of specifically the prior. So this is prior free. There, there's no prior here that I need to get tangled up in. Uh, and also on a previous slide, or, or on the next slide, I was indicating, look, it's, it's far easier just to construct a distribution estimator, right? Than it is to say, okay, well, I've got to construct a prior, I've got to then update it to the posterior. Um, and often that's not easy to do in Bayes non-parametric problems. Whereas uh, if you're willing and happy to interpret Bayes as just putting a distribution estimator, uh, given what you've seen, um, and you and then you're happy to say that's a faithful interpretation of Bayesian uncertainty. That's all I'm required to do. Um, then uh, what we're doing follows as a logical consequence. Um, I'll skip out that example one because it's parametric. This is just basically showing the dual idea of being able to take all these limits and the posterior, right? So this is when there's a real uh, posterior. So the, the, the non-parametric example is really using uh, our friendly Galaxy dataset. Um, so we basically took a dense, a distribution estimator uh we actually did it got it using the copula model the reason is is because it's asymptotically well behaved so even though there's only 82 data points it's still 
it's a good estimator of a density or a distribution. I mean, differentiate to get the density, it's smooth so you can differentiate it. But other, other things are possible. It's not that you have to have anything in particular. It's just, you know, just like you don't need to have any particular prior in particular. You know, you, no classical person will say, oh, well, I, I must have this particular distribution estimator. I mean, you can take your pick. Um, so uh, if you want to do the comparison of uh, all these random p infinities you're getting compared to uh, they, they're not going to be exactly the same because you can't match up a prior um, you know, with a different type of predictive. Um, so it all depends on what prior you use as to how much the uncertainty bounds are on, um, on these two pictures. But you can see, I mean, it's, it's, it's doing a pretty good job. So the, um, the, the one on the left, of me is doing the popular and the one on the right is doing the Dirichlet, the, the regular Dirichlet process. Um, so that's just directly sampling from the posterior. Um, okay, so just, just to summarize. So the first line, I guess, is the real key. And as I said, when I did this talk before the paper went up on archive and it was about Bayesian uncertainty. Really, it was just starting with that top line. But really, just, just think of Bayes as constructing something like this and how you would then, um, you know, that automatically defines a distribution on a parameter of interest, whether you need to do the sampling or not. I mean, uh, because the idea is that whatever it is you're interested in becomes fully or uniquely defined given x1 to infinity, right? Um, and it also takes away this issue about, oh, well, Bayesians don't take the uncertainty of what you have seen into account. Yeah, but you, you don't need to because it's always going to be part of the infinite sequence. So that's the point. You've seen it. You're always going to put it into your infinite sequence. Um, so to us, that, that's, or to me at least, that's, that's really dealing with the uncertainty of a finite sample. Um, so in the non-parametric setting, the p-infinity is the limit. So you, you so, I mean, typically in the non-parametric problems, apart from, I, I guess, the Bayesian bootstrap where you can do that exactly, uh, you'd be generating the x's, I mean, you can take the limit of the p infinities on the copula or, or equivalently, uh, and this is a, a Rigo Bertie type result, you can also take the empirical of the actual x's you've sampled and you can get the p infinity, take the limit. Uh, and that would be representing your uncertainty. So each time you did that, the p infinity would just represent a random draw uh, from your martingale posterior. Uh, um, as, as, as you would do just by, if you were fully Bayes, uh, taking it from the posterior. So Bayes now becomes a special case. So if I'm willing to adopt uh, certain regulations on how I construct my sequence of distribution estimators, if I, which I argue doesn't actually contribute to accuracy in any way, it's just a nice thing to have exchangeability, I guess, um, then you don't need to do all of this. You can just take it directly from the um, posterior. So another way to view what's happened is that we're basically relaxing exchangeability to conditionally identically distributed because it makes things simpler. It's, it's, it's simpler to implement. And it's not violating the Bayes principle if you're willing to agree that Bayes is really what I've written on the top line there. So this is just uh, Bertie and Rigo's result in 2006. Uh, it's not... Uh, the martingale is effectively all that's required here for the convergence. Um, so there's a theorem 2.2 in this paper, which actually provides all the uh, ingredients. 
And that concludes. Um, and for those interested, uh, UT is hiring. Uh, so if you check out the web page, you'll find the details. Um, okay, thanks very much. And that's, okay. that concludes. Thanks. Okay, let's, let's thank Stephen for his presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, we we have time for for questions so if you have any questions or comments for stephen uh, please turn on your mic and go ahead and raise your hand or write your question in the chat Felipe, so, there is yes, a, have... yes, there is a hand raised yes. by Maria Calli. Yes. Please, Maria, go ahead. Wait, it's, uh, sorry, it's me. It's Jim. It's Jim. Ah, it's Jim. It's not. It's Jim that has a question. I'm here, but Jim okay. has a question. <laughs> Hi, Stephen. <laughs> Hi. Hi. So, yeah, uh, interesting stuff. So, so in, in, there's a kind of a practical question. You have this parameter rho in your galaxy data example, which you set to be 0.93. But, but in practice, how would you choose that? Um, and how does how does the result change if you kind of change that? Uh, so it's like it's like a, a bandwidth kind of thing. So it's a smoothing. It's how much smoothing you'd mm. you'd want. Um, so one, if I put the row towards one, that recovers me the indicator, right? So that that would be the sort of um uh thinking that if the closer i get to one the more i go back to the indicator and the bayesian bootstrap thing so it's it's a case of smoothing um you know if so um <laughs> we all know that what's the answer to smoothing uh so from a lot of empirical uh, running and things. I typically go for 0.95, somewhere between 0 0.9, 0 0.95. Uh, so you're not moving too far away from, uh, you know, you're not putting down something that's flat. So each point actually resonates, right? It, it forms a, a sort of, I mean, you, you, you could do based on the kernel density idea for the bandwidth, you know, how much of a variance do you put on each component? Because mm. you've got a very similar idea going on here. So there's no there's no formal theorem proof answer to what is rho, right? It's, it's, no, no, of course not. Uh, it's a smoothing parameter. So we all know what sort of issues smoothing parameters give us, right? Um, so obviously a rho going to zero just flattens everything out and you end up with rubbish. A row at one gives you um, back the Bayesian bootstrap. So um, empirical evidence would suggest between 0 0.9 0 0.95 in most problems. Yeah. Okay, so that's kind of interesting, right? That's a bit like uh, if you do things like exponentially weighted moving averages, then you have kind of default, reasonable default values that you can kind of use. Uh, I mean, you could, you could, uh, yeah, I mean, um, I, I guess at this point, the, uh, the, where we're at with it is, is sort of, you know, there's probably more pressing issues in terms of, hey, what are you doing? As, a, as opposed to, okay, you know, it's good to see that, okay, let's, get, once we're onto the row, then it's like, okay, we've all agreed that this is a good thing to do. And, and so, yeah, okay, we can look into exactly how to come up with a, a principal data-driven row, right? Um, but at, at this point, I'd say it's a smoothing parameter. Those are difficult. You could equate it to a kernel density estimator bandwidth, you know, and how they're empirically chosen from data. Uh, so it's not that there's not going to be any way of pursuing that. It's just 
I, I guess in terms of priorities, it's something that hasn't been, we haven't looked at in any great detail as yet. Okay. Okay, thanks. Any other question? I thought Michele wanted to ask something or not? Yes, I have uh, two uh, stupid questions, so I'm a bit ashamed of asking. Uh, um, um, so the they're, usually, one... they're usually the hardest, you know, people <laughs> say that and then they turn out to be the hardest. So I don't know. I don't know. I don't think so. But well, the first one is actually the following. So you mentioned different copulas uh, uh, that could be used uh, and decided to try different copulas. So did you, uh, is there any uh, difference in terms of accuracy at the end uh, uh, when you use different copulas uh, or um, uh, I mean, any, any uh, of those that you've tried uh, work similarly? Um, and the second question is uh, um, by uh, taking your argument uh, to the extreme, uh, uh, when you look at the sequence, uh, it looks like uh, um, maybe there is not even needed to consider uh, the uh, posterior distribution. I mean, the PM, uh, the PM given X1, X, uh, M, right? If I remember your notation correctly you could do any good approximation. And as long as you have a sequence, uh, a CID sequence, you're gonna get uh, to a, a limit, uh, to a marking and the limit that could uh, uh, work for posterior inference, for inference. Right, can I do, I'll do the second one first? So, so you need two things, I think. You need a good distribution estimator at the beginning, given X1 to N. You, is, is that the point you're making? Yes, correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you need the Martingale sequence that, so you, you need those sequences of good distribution estimators which satisfy a Martingale condition. And uh, it, it just seems apparent that the copula sequence is just tailor-made for it. I mean, they just, because you can understand Bayes, fully Bayes, in terms of the copula anyway, and really all you're doing is simplifying the comp complicated copulas you get from real Bayes to something that's simple. And yet you're only throwing away the exchangeability, which the, the debate is, well, does that contribute to accuracy? You know, accuracy in the sense that I can quite happily get faithful uh, P infinity, if you like, that represent uncertainty um, uh, without, without exchangeability. The idea being, as long as my distribution estimators are good, right? You know, you'd say, well, the argument is whether I start off with a predictive distribution estimator or some other distribution estimator, because the sequences are coming from those, right? Yeah. So you might say, well, why do I need one that forces exchangeability anymore? I just need something that's a good distribution estimator, but I need a Martingale and mm -hmm. the copula approach seems absolutely tailor-made for that. Uh, and so having mentioned the copula, so the, 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 the copula, so there may be, you might say, okay, which is the more, which gives you the more accurate, which is more accurate from a frequentist consistency point of view, right? You might say, okay, well, uh, which, which one is more suited, which one uh, is a better distribution estimator, what copula, uh, Gaussian copula or some other copula. I would, I would probably think that it, it still doesn't make any difference. The difference would be some unknown coefficient of some that you just wouldn't be able to determine. You'd get the same and you just wouldn't be able to determine uh, that. So, you know, the reason why people use kernel density estimators using the normal distribution is probably as good a reason as to why we would stick with the Gaussian copula. You know, again, you know, once you get down to the point where you're arguing over which copula to use, you know, the bulk of the argument has gone through, if you like, yeah? So, um, so I guess at this point, it's still trying to convince people that the heart of Bayes is actually constructing this distribution on what's missing, given what you've seen. Thanks. Any other questions, comments?
It's not maybe you can ask the, the last question. Probably this is this is a silly one as well. No, no, no as well. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so in the in this in this method that, that you are proposing with this copula, that you you mentioned that you are using the, the Bayesian bootstrap. And and the Bayesian bootstrap has point masses, right? So I was uh -huh. thinking that at some point you the estimates we're going to have point masses, but because you are using the copula, then you don't have point masses anymore. They... Yeah, can you see this? Is yes. it still on the screen? Yeah, so, yeah. so this effect, effectively, the idea is to smooth this. Uh... And the, the consequences are that you throw away exchangeability. Uh, <laughs> the, the question is, so I guess the key question is whether you're willing to do that. And our argument for why you could be willing to do that is the top line of here, hmm. right? Because that's all I need. That's all we need. That's Bayes. So, so, so if you say, well, I'm willing to say that's Bayes now, <coughs> then that's all you need. Um, and you then might ask yourself, what is the role of exchangeability in the um, I know that uh, at a Bayesian, I know it's non-parametric, so I'm putting the non-parametrics well, well before the Bayes at this point. Um, but, but genuinely, I'm, I'm, you know, if, if you see what Dube's result actually says, then you're really just saying, well, if there's these two ways of doing the same thing, why have I picked on the posterior as the default? Why am I not thinking more about this alternative and playing along and seeing exactly what I can do there, right? In, in ways of generalizing and, um, and then you can start simplifying exactly the thought processes that you go through, which is, I just need a distribution estimate. I just need a martingale. Thank you. So, any other question before we finish? Um, perhaps uh, I, I would ask a question. To there is a question in chat. In chat. Okay, there is a question oh. in chat first. I can't see in the chat. Can somebody read it out? I'm not sure. I yes, I can, I can do it. Can we use the predictive distributions that can be shown to converge, but are not necessarily Martin Gaines? Um, so I think if it's not a martingale, you'd have to deal with things on a case by case basis. So if you want a general framework like the exchangeability provides, which is a martingale already, you have a framework in which you don't have to keep checking out anything on a case by case basis. Right? So, that, so that's the point here. It's dropping to something where, again, you wouldn't have to go on a case by case basis and establishing uh, there's a, a limit exists. Right? It, it's just moving it down to where all the theory is currently known. Uh, and so we don't have any. You don't have to, you know, you, you don't have to, every time you come up with a different model, have to check whether you've got some convergence. I don't, I, I mean, I, I don't know. Is there a, would, so the question is, I guess, is there a less, is there something you can go down even further and claim that you still have a general framework for convergence? So it wouldn't, if, if it's not CID anymore, remember you've got to, you've got to, you want the martingale as well because you don't want to introduce bias. You really do want the expected random distribution to be centered on what you've seen, right? Your starting point. I mean, you would want that, right? That, that would be a sort of, um, so the martingale seems as low as you'd go simply because you would want the expected value of p and phi to p infinity to be what you've seen. You might say, well, I, I'm happy with a little bit of bias, but you really wouldn't want a lot of bias, right? Because that wouldn't make sense. Your expectation starts to drift away from your starting 
distribution estimator. So that would be the problem with trying to move this even further. So I, I would say that it shouldn't go any further for that reason, that Martin Gales um, would be important. And hence the title, Martin Gale Posterior. Right? Mm -hmm. So the Martin Gale becomes the important feature now. Okay, well, thank you everyone for uh, your comments and questions. And let's thank Stephen again. And thank you very much. Uh, thank you. so please recall that the recording of this presentation will be available at the ISBAS YouTube channel. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you.